Bill Hartung is with us, the person who's done the most to reveal uh, the business of uh, weapons production and the business of the Pentagon budget and is going to talk to us about uh, how they manage to control our congressman, I hope. Uh, I was asked if I have slides. I just have hand gestures. Um, so the nuclear weapons lobby, as you might imagine, is quite uh, powerful, and they've been winning the battle of the budget. Um, the Pentagon is talking about spending $1.2 trillion over the next three decades to build a whole new generation of nuclear bombers, ballistic missile submarines, land-based missiles, cruise missiles, new nuclear warheads, uh, sort of the whole range of nuclear warheads and nuclear delivery vehicles. They want to build brand new ones. And the $1.2 trillion is undoubtedly an underestimate because they haven't factored in the cost overruns, uh, which are huge in these systems. Um, but I want to go back to the beginning. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk, in essence, about the nuclear part of the military industrial complex. Uh, but the nuclear weapons industry really was the foundation of the military industrial complex. And it was the reason that President Eisenhower coined that term. Um, he was reacting to things like the bomber lobby. Uh, he didn't think a new nuclear bomber was needed. He thought it was a waste of money. Uh, but the industry and many of his own generals, who allegedly are supposed to follow the lead of the commander-in-chief, were speaking out about the need for the bomber, about a bomber gap with the Soviet Union. Uh, and he had to spend a lot of time pushing back against that. Um, then we had the missile gap, which was kind of the, you know, Iraq war of the nuclear issue, where they ginned up uh, unsupportable intelligence to say that, well, indeed, uh, we also have a gap uh, in ballistic missiles uh, with the Soviet Union. And interestingly, um, in addition to generals and think tanks and the industry, uh, a lot of Democratic senators uh, got on this bandwagon, uh, including uh, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Stuart Symington, uh, partly to use it as a political force uh, against Eisenhower and then against uh, Nixon in the 1960 election. Um, and of course, when Kennedy came in, uh, they did a little looking and they found out, yes, there was a missile gap, but it was in the other direction. The United States had far more ballistic missiles than the Soviet Union, which was just kind of getting, uh, figuring all that out. Um, and uh, Eisenhower himself spoke about this. Uh, he described the missile gap argument as, quote, a useful piece of political demagoguery. And he also said, uh, and I quote, munitions makers are making tremendous efforts towards getting more contracts and in fact seem to be exerting undue influence over the senators, uh, which is the same term he used about the military industrial complex in his famous 1961 speech. Um, and one of the important things within the Eisenhower speech was he said, um, because it's a nuclear age, we can't any longer improvise the means of national defense. There's no time to mobilize if a war can begin in minutes or seconds. Uh, and therefore, that's one of the reasons for the evolution of this large permanent arms establishment. Uh, you don't really have demobilization after wars in any significant way. Um, so the, the legacy of that is that we've got nuclear facilities spread all over the United States. And whenever you challenge a nuclear program, uh, their, uh, you know, argument of last resort is the jobs card. Uh, you know, on the one hand, well, we could annihilate the world. On the other hand, there's jobs involved. So if you really thought about it, it's, it's not really a logical argument, but it works politically. Um, and if you look at the, the spread of just the major facilities, we have either weapons labs, warhead facilities, uh, missile bomber production sites, submarine bases, missile silos, in Washington State, California, New Mexico, Texas, Missouri, Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, Georgia, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, not to mention subcontractors spread all over the country. Um, so th this is one of the ways that the nuclear industry keeps itself going. And of course, they exaggerate the number of jobs involved, because why not? They're marketing a product. Um, and there are other ways to create jobs. Uh, 
which would create many more jobs per dollar spent. Uh, but education and healthcare and infrastructure don't have this massive lobby and this massive money machine behind them. So they often lose in these uh, budget debates. Um, so the nuclear industry has a lot of levers of influence uh, because it's a subset of the larger military industry. Uh, so for example, in the last two election cycles, uh, the military industries given $50 million in contributions. And they know who to give it to. It's always to Armed Services Committee members, Defense Appropriations Committee members, uh, members with military bases or plants in their districts. And that's how they build their coalition, kind of their political wall against cuts in nuclear or military spending. Um, they spend 10 times that on lobbying, about 500 million in the last four years. And perhaps most important, are the numbers of lobbyists. Uh, in any given year, the military industry has between 700 and 1,000 lobbyists working the halls of Congress. So in some years, almost two for every member of Congress. And some uh, staffers have told me, uh, even ones who aren't on the key committees, uh, sometimes they'll spend 20% of their time either listening to or fending off uh, lobbyists from the military industry. Uh, and most of these lobbyists used to work in government in Congress, in the Pentagon, the National Security Council, the White House. Um, and so they go back to their former colleagues and they exert sort of their personal influence. Uh, but they also kind of wink and nod and say, well, you know, if you want a high paying job like mine when you get out of government, maybe you should play ball with me on this issue. Um, and, you know, Donald Trump, there was a lot of talk when he came in about how he loves generals. General Mattis, General McMaster, General Kelly. Uh, you know, General Electric, um, and, uh, but he also loves uh, weapons industry executives. Um, uh, James Mattis was on the board of General Dynamics before he came into government, which makes ballistic missile submarines, among other things. Um, John Kelly, the White House Chief of Staff, was at DynCor, a private military contractor uh, that was involved in corruption and worse in Iraq and the Balkans uh, and elsewhere. Um, uh, John Rood, who's the director of policy at the Pentagon, the third in charge, was at Lockheed Martin. Heather Wilson, the secretary of the Air Force, was involved in a questionable lobbying scheme on behalf of uh, Lockheed Martin, sort of the lobbying equivalent of a no-show job. They gave her a bunch of money. Nobody knows exactly what she did. Although perhaps if they're working for the contractors, that's a good thing. Um, uh, and then uh, Mark Esper, the Secretary of the Army, was formerly at Raytheon, their chief lobbyist. Ellen Lord, who runs acquisition at the Pentagon, was at Textron, which for a long time made cluster bombs. Uh, Patrick Shanahan, who's the second in charge at the Pentagon, was formerly at Boeing, working on missile defense. So among other things, you've got the top three people of the Pentagon, all from contractor community, uh, which is, as far as I know, uh, unique in our history. And then there's dozens of others of former military industry people peppered throughout the government. And given that Trump has a hard time appointing people, there are a disproportionate amount of the people who actually made it into government. Um, but the appointment of John Rood from Lockheed Martin was kind of late in the process. And finally, a few members of Congress said, wait a minute. You know, so John McCain sort of said, this is the last one. We're not letting any more of these folks in here. Uh, and Elizabeth Warren spoke out, um, and she said um, the following, no taxpayer should have to wonder whether the top policymakers at the Pentagon are pushing defense products and foreign military sales for reasons other than the protection of the United States of America. No American should have to wonder whether the Defense Department is acting to protect the national interests of our nation or the financial interests of the five giant defense contractors. Well, that nomination sailed through uh, by a vote of 81 to 7 in the Senate. So I guess we still have to wonder uh, whether the financial interests are trumping the national interest. Um, and then there's, there's various other ways of exerting influence. There's think tanks. Contractors fund think tanks to be sort of their political uh, and media front people. Uh, so you've got places like the Center for Security Policy run by Frank Gaffney, who's probably one of the scariest individuals ever to grace the halls of uh, Washington. Um, he's a big missile defense booster, he's a huge Islamophobe, and he's funded by contractors. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Lauren Thompson at the Lexington Institute, who's ubiquitous in stories about defense equipment. Um, 
He is funded by Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, many other contractors, something which is rarely pointed out uh, when he's quoted. Uh, and he's never met a weapon system he doesn't like. Um, and uh, of course, they fund heritage and many other places. They fund liberal think tanks or quote liberal think tanks like the Center for New American Security, which was started by, among others, Michelle Flournoy, who was thought to perhaps be in line to be Hillary Clinton's uh, Secretary of Defense. Um, then you've got various caucuses. You've got a submarine caucus in Congress. Time's up, which has many meanings now. Um, <laughs> so um, there's, there's plenty other, but I think the bottom line is uh, you know, our defense policy should be about what makes us safe, not about what, what makes contractors rich. And we should talk more about that, and I'm going to stick to my time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, when they lobby for Pentagon contract, and they always claim it's all about the troops, but how much of the money actually goes to contractors versus the troops? Uh, well, um, if you dig through some of the government databases, it looks like in a given year, contractors get $300, $350 billion from the Pentagon, about essentially about half of the Pentagon budget. Uh, and there's hundreds of thousands of them doing all kinds of things. Uh, there's almost as many private contractors as there are civilians at the Pentagon. Um, so a lot of this is going to the contractors, and a lot of it is being wasted. So you know, they always say, well, you know, the planes are falling out of the sky, the troops can't be trained. Uh, when there was a ship crash in the Pacific, several, um, you know, they blamed it on not enough money. Uh, but it ends up uh, they had uh, gotten rid of a very rigorous training course for the people who piloted the ships uh, because they said they didn't have any money. And that course was $15 million with an M, which for me is a lot, but for the Pentagon is not even a rounding error in, of a percentage. Uh, so, yeah, I think they used the troops essentially as the poster children to basically pick our pockets to build nuclear weapons, which obviously don't depend, uh, protect the troops. Uh, there's about $25 billion in um, you know, bureaucratic waste every year. Uh, there's the F-35, which isn't ready for combat. We're going to spend over a trillion on that over its lifetime. So um, I think you know, the logic of that is weak, but the emotional appeal is strong. And I think one of the things that's helpful is there's a lot of veterans coming out now who are reasonably progressive. Some of them are running for Congress. They've seen the waste up close. And in many cases, they're more, uh, one of my colleagues uh, teaches at a, a military school. Uh, he is, you know, whenever he talks about Pentagon waste, we're spending too much money, um, they're right with him. They're saying, oh, that's not the half of it, you know. Um, so the people who've been in the military, uh, you know, perhaps uh, uncharacteristically or unexpectedly, uh, would probably tell you that, in fact, there's plenty of money and that it's misallocated. Well, they're throwing a lot of money at auditing the Pentagon this year. Uh, David Norquist, Grover's brother, is in charge. Um, and he actually did get them to audit the Department of Homeland Security. So some people, um, you know, who are kind of fiscal hawks, are holding out some hope that they might actually get this done. Uh, but I'm working with a group called um, Truth and Accounting, a group I never thought I would be affiliated with. Uh, and they. Um, are kind of monitoring this, and it's not looking good so far. I mean, they have uncovered, yes, more waste, uh, but it's not clear they've done anything to prevent future waste. So, uh, you know, I think they should be held to account. But of course, even if they could count every penny, they're spending it on things that shouldn't be spent on. You know, so they build a, a Trident missile, and they can give you the receipts. That's not enough for me. You know, so I, I, I do think they're making an effort on the audit, but I don't think uh, they're making any progress that's going to save the taxpayers money. And to me, you know, a Pentagon that keeps its receipts is a pretty low bar. Uh, yes, the uh, various ballistic missile defense systems, going back to Reagan's Star Wars speech and before, continue to get billions and billions of dollars, despite the fact that hard evidence shows that they're not particularly effective. Uh, what do I think about that? Uh, well, it's an outrage. Um, but I won't stop there. Um, you know, I, I think the Star Wars and missile defense lobby is, is among the more effective elements of the um, military industrial complex. They've got these think tanks on their side. They've got sort of an emotional appeal. Uh, you know, when Reagan, uh, Francis Fitzgerald wrote a book um, on missile defense, um, 
called, I think, Way Out There in the Blue. It's, it's a quote from Death of a Salesman. Um, and um, anyway, one of the things that emerged was that um, Reagan was quite concerned about the nuclear freeze campaign when it started reaching the mainstream churches and it wasn't just a bunch of people like me, you know, uh, peaceniks. And um, so uh, some of his advisors said, you know, you got to do something about this. This is going to hurt you politically. And so they did two things. They came up with kind of an arms control package or argument. Uh, and then they also said, well, missile defense. You got to give some people to feel like, reason to feel like they're not going to be blown off the face of the earth. And so we're going to put the push on Star Wars. So even from the beginning, it was partly a PR gesture more than a, technical gesture. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, they use the argument of, you know, did you realize we're not being defended against nuclear weapons? And if you don't know anything about the subject, you're like, well, that's ridiculous. Of course we should be defended. Uh, but the things don't work, and it's just an illusion to keep the whole system going. Because if you think you can be defended, you're less likely to push against the nuclear weapons uh, themselves. So um, they're actually among the greatest beneficiaries of this new uh, buildup. Uh, you know, billions of dollars above the 10 billion or so a year they've been getting just routinely. Um, one of the largest entitlement programs in the budget. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, they're, they're selling us kind of snake oil, but at a very high price and uh, a very dangerous price. Yeah, a part of it um, was the weapons labs uh, lobbying. Part of it was in order to get two-thirds to get the New START treaty. He had to cut a deal with some of the most conservative pro-nuclear senators on the Republican side. So they made sort of a devil's bargain where they said, all right, we will do this significant buildup. And they argued that it was for reliability, you know, because, you know, God forbid you're trying to end the world and the warheads don't work. Um, and um, so, um, so they made that bargain to get the 13 Republican votes to bring in New START, which cut deployed warheads about a third on both sides, but uh, didn't go nearly far enough. Uh, so it's not clear that that bargain was worth it in terms of what we're seeing now. Uh, but you would need, I think, a president who would really make this a top priority, would go over the heads of Congress to the country uh, to educate them and, and why we need reductions in nuclear weapons, why they're making us, they're not making us safer, they're making the world a much more dangerous place. Uh, but it, it's one of the um, arguments that the lobby uses, the reliable nuclear weapon argument. Uh, and also you did have members of Congress, like the, um, I didn't mention the uh, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Caucus, uh, which is most, every weapon has a caucus. Uh, so they're mostly senators from Wyoming, North Dakota, Montana, Utah, where the ICBM silos are. And even when we, uh, so they pushed that uh, they not hit too hard on ballistic missiles in the treaty. And so they were getting rid of, you know, 50 out of 450. And then the silos, which they wanted to destroy, the ICBM caucus said, oh, no, don't destroy them. Keep them in what's known as warm status. So when we build up again, they'll have somewhere to put them, and you should put them in our state. Uh, so even, even smaller things like a study of how you might destroy the silos was blocked by that caucus. And it was partly because at that time you had Democratic senators who were in difficult electoral positions like Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota. Uh, and so that, that exerted influence over President Obama uh, because they didn't want to lose the Senate. Um, so there's a lot of elements of politics that get in the way of what we want to get accomplished here. Uh, but other than really getting up front and personal with our elected representatives and doing a better job of educating the public, that this is an urgent danger, not something to put to the side, um, then I think, you know, these techniques will continue to work. Uh, well, a lot of times there's kind of economics at the root of it. You know, you've got firms like BAE Systems, and a lot of candidates like to do their stand-ups in front of that factory when they run for president, that sort of thing. Um, but I think also there's something corrosive about being in Congress. Uh, you know, you start speaking Congress speak, and you start talking about threats and kinetic attacks and all this stuff. Uh, almost like as a way to earn your spurs as a member of Congress, you have to buy into this ideology and this language. Uh, so I think that's part of the problem. Um, as a conservative friend of mine said, a lot of the people in the Armed Services Committee view it as more of a fundraising opportunity than a policy opportunity. 
so I, I think there's all of those matters, but I, I don't have any like secrets about how to go about it. Um, you know, other than them feeling like there's a strong enough political force uh, that they have to pay a price uh, for uh, making those kinds of bad choices, whereas now they feel like there's political benefit. You know, they don't have to worry about being seen as soft on defense. There's an economic benefit. There's a contributions benefit. Uh, but it, I think it is good to puncture their rhetoric because a lot of them, even though they do all of that, they try to say they're acting in the best interest of the country and our safety and so forth, which is self-evidently not the truth if you look at the consequences of their votes. Um, but I agree. It, it is disappointing when you come across a member like that who seems well, certainly as an improvement over the alternative, but still is um, so hard to move on these kind of very important issues. All right. Thank you.